testing. Hope this works. Is it the angry paper towel salesman? Is he back? Is he going to hurt us again? Yes, I'm here to hurt you guys. I'm here to hurt you with some pseudo lit RPG. This actually isn't lit RPG, but it's kind of adjacent. In fact, I just found out yesterday that it's in a subgenre thereof. But first, the formalities. Hey guys, it's Graham. What's cracking? This fine piece of fiction right here, it's a YA sci-fi co-written by Lydia Scherer and John Ringo. I hope I'm saying Lydia's name right. I've never read anything by her before. John Ringo, I have read before. He is a very accomplished sci-fi author, very good at writing action adventure. And um, he just also has this, uh, this tendency to randomly throw his characters into acts of wanton carnal depravity, we'll say. I am happy to say, though, that this book does not. Um, I can tell kind of where his fingerprints are with like the military stuff. But uh, I would not be surprised if I read a Lydia Scherer book and it was very, very similar in tone and substance to this one. So because it, it just felt like a new experience compared to, to reading a, a John Ringo book. I will say, though, and this will come up a couple of times, you do get some regular reminders that our female protagonist was pimp slapped by the puberty creature in uh, her early teens. And so she has somewhat large melons. All right. So the title is Into the Real. It's the first in the Transdimensional Hunter series. What is the real? It is the opposite of the mesh. The mesh is the new slang word for the internet. Um, like I said, in this is set in a future where uh, you know money's worth less, kids game more, and uh, you can monetize it even more than you can now. And so kids who play these games can also kind of make a, a decent part-time job out of it. And uh, our protagonist is a girl named Lynn Raven. She's 16 at the time that the book starts. And uh, she's actually one of the best gamers in the world. But she's pretending to be a, an older military veteran man, a guy who's seen it all, done the things, knows how to hurt people. And she doesn't tell her friends what she does. She doesn't want anybody knowing that she's pretending to be this Larry Coughlin character. However, when a brand new game is coming out from the developers, they want some of their best gamers out there to be beta testers for it. And so they reach out to her. They obviously know that you know through the billing and all that, that she's actually this, this teen girl. And they say, hey, well, we'll send you the equipment. Uh, we want you to bring your skills to this game, but it's different from the console games that you play. This is going to be, I say console, there's other terminology for this. This is what's called an augmented reality game where you put on computer glasses and you go outside. And uh, it's kind of like Pokemon Go. You see things that only show up with the glasses and you've got to use special tools to eliminate them. And the more monsters you kill, the more you level up and so on and so forth. It actually gets kids outside. This is where I'm going to pause really quick and say that the book was kind of pitched to me by fellow upstream writer Declan Finn as uh, Pokemon Go meets Ender's Game. Just invoking Ender's Game is going to imply a spoiler. I want to tell you right now that distinguished readers will be able to tell what that spoiler is pretty early on, and they'll do it well in advance of any of the characters. It doesn't necessarily spoil it or relieve the tension of the book. The story is a self-contained story, and the Ender's Game element of it comes in as kind of a cliffhanger at the end. Like I said, readers will see it coming, but it's fine. It still makes the book a very enjoyable read. In fact, as I was listening to the audiobook this week, I kept wanting to go back to it. And that's a very, very good sign. So uh, it follows the whole Pokemon Go. You go outside, you actually play a game in your neighborhood, in your town, wherever. But there is something else going on beyond just kids playing a game. But like I said, Lynn gets to go outside now. Uh, you know, her, her mom is initially hesitant at first because this is a low trust, high crime era. But, you know, she knows where she's going to go. And she's like, OK, you know, you can go do this. and It'll be good for you to get some sun and get some exercise. And she finds exercise difficult because, one, she's kind of out of shape. And two, doing cardio is difficult because of her enormous breasts. John Ringo, I know you're in there. Anyway, Lynn succeeds with the beta version of the game and then it goes public and she does have to tell a couple of her friends like, yeah, not only am I a gamer, but I'm a very good one. I got in on the beta of this one, but uh, slight twist. It's no longer solo now that it's a public game. I mean, you can play it solo, but there's a big contest going on and it's team based. Now she's got to work well with her, her team friends who are accomplished gamers, but one of them is very antagonistic towards the idea of having a girl on the team and now she's got a new hurdle to overcome. 
that's what I'd say like the, the middle onward of the book is really focused on is them trying to compete together so that they can win a massive prize that pops up at the end. It's kind of like Ready Player One, only it's not an egregious flogging of your childhood fondness of 80s content mixed with screeds about, well, if you read Ready Player One, you know. I'm in the minority of people that really didn't like that book. It sucked. This one does not suck. This one is highly entertaining, but I digress. Lynn is a really likable character, and she goes through some real challenges, not just with the team dynamic, but also like the, the real effects of going from being a sedentary gamer to being an active gamer and you know, having to learn how to exercise, eat right, all that stuff. Uh, it, it made it very credible. You know, I myself have gone on some intense fitness journeys, training for Tough Mudders and stuff over the years, and uh, it felt very authentic to me on that front. And she's surrounded by a really good cast of supporting characters. The other four guys in her group, there's one of them that really likes her. There's one of them that really hates her. There are two guys that are kind of in between and just want to compete for the prize. So uh, it, it helps you to distinguish them all as you go. She's got some antagonists at school, mostly. It's, it's kind of a mean girl situation. It does feel like this girl is just a capital B with no real reason other than maybe she's got some daddy issues or whatever. There is a slight cookie cutter element to that. Minor aside here. So I got to the point a couple of years ago where I realized I was going to start training coworkers who were literally half my age. And I was talking to this guy who had just graduated high school as he was working with me up in the mountains of Utah. And we were talking about Cobra Kai, the TV show. And he was saying that it was a little bit unrealistic because bullying the way that it's depicted in that show, which is really just kind of a throwback to 80s and 90s bullying as they have it in public school. He goes, Kids can't really get away with that anymore. This is you know, what he was saying. And so that kind of stuff just feels like a, a holdover you know, from Gen X writers and shows like this. Uh, maybe it's just because the Gen Z types are, are oh, too soft to bully each other. It is what it is. And so uh, it, it feels like it's a little bit less credible. But then again, it is kind of set in an inner city in Iowa. So... Who the heck knows? It, it works well enough for the story because you've got to have characters that go through challenges no matter what Gen Z tells you. But I digress. I digress. Anyway, it, it works well enough for what it is. There were times when I was reading it and I was like, these characters are just stupid. And sometimes the protagonist falls for things where you're like, oh, come on. Why would you do this? No, don't be this dumb. They're teenagers. They're not written in such a way that the dumb things they do were meant to like force something in the plot. They're just written as teenagers. So it's, it's good on that front. Something else that I noticed about two thirds of the way through the book is that, so there's this modern push amongst mainstream publishing to do, you know, forced diversity and representation and stuff. This is happening in publishing and has been for a long time. It's a bigger story right now in the gaming space. And it's been in uh, you know cinema and TV for a while now. Um, I wouldn't say that Bain Books, the publisher, is is one that's doing this because they're not. Like they're famously ones that don't care about that kind of ideology stuff. They just want to tell and publish good books. Uh, but this is a book that it has it, and it doesn't beat you over the head with it. It's just there. Like the story isn't even centered on it. It's not like a, a tiered race system where this race is bad, this race is victims, blah blah blah. Our main character is half Lakota on her mom's side and uh, Scandinavian Viking, something or other. I don't remember if it, her dad was like Norwegian or Swedish or something, you know, American, but of that heritage. Uh, the guy that likes her is Samoan. The guy that hates her is Lithuanian. And it's not like a, a racial or a nationalistic thing. It's just, okay, these kids know where they came from and they're, they're close enough to the, uh, the immigrant generation of their parents that every once in a while they'll shout out an exclamation or a curse in their native language or something. But it's not, it's not so overly prevalent that it distracts from the story or that it bludgeons the reader or that it takes it out. Like it's a great example of, Hey, let's have diversity and then just focus on the story. Not that hard. That's more like the real world than any of this overly forced representative crap that we get today. There was even a gay guy in the book who didn't have to get you know misty eyed about how back in the day people were oppressing him or whatever. He was able to keep a secret for Lynn about the fact that she was this uh, really accomplished gamer because, you know, Hey, I took, I was in the closet for a long time before anybody knew it. She's like, Oh, okay. You know, she didn't know that he was gay. Not a big deal. Didn't come up again. She did appreciate the fact that he didn't ogle her or her boobs, which were considerably large. After you get through those big arcs in the middle of the book, you know, her 
focusing on our game playing skills and our team building skills and all that. And they get to the climax, which is this big tournament. Uh, from there, the execution is, is solid. It's great. It's good fun. I will say that there were times when the book felt like it slowed down a lot and that had to do with the training, the missions, the combat sessions and stuff, the, the leveling up of it all. This is where I would kind of compare it to a lit RPG, which is often overly focused on that stuff, but it is a story about a girl playing a game and it makes sense here. It's not abusive of the reader's attention span. It's just something that I noticed because it's something that frustrates me with this type of book in a general sense. Um, it, it worked here, but there were just times when, like I said, it slowed down the narrative, uh, but it wasn't so dug into the sand on like, okay, I killed this and it was worth this many points and I leveled up to here. So I had to do it, blah, blah, blah. Like there is leveling up, there is all that stuff, but it works. It's a collaborative book. And my general rule is that any book with two authors is twice as long as it needs to be. That's a gram thing. Um, the book in audio was about 18 hours in print. It's 560 pages and it's only like 15 or 16 chapters long. So these chapters are substantial. Uh, you know, it's not like you're just burning through them and, and that's that. I was pleased to see that the second book is only two thirds as long. So it seems like, you know, now that all the characters are set and the world is set and all that, they can just burn through the story, especially because they've got a heck of a, uh, of a cliffhanger to pick up on. I think I hear squirrels on my roof. One double-edged sword of this book, a good thing and a bad thing, is the content. Uh, like I said, it's a very clean book, which I enjoy. It makes it easier for me to recommend books like this broadly. You know, my wife, for example, she doesn't care to read stuff with a whole lot of profanity or sensual content in it. And, you know, for the most part, I've got a palate that can tolerate an amount of that. I have been working in garages and yards and warehouses and all that stuff since my teens. But I would just as soon not read something that's overly heavy on it. This book seems aggressively committed to not using profanity. And there are times when the insults that they do come up with for these teens, just uh, they take you out of it. They land very, very softly when you've got kids calling each other like dweeb face and jerkwad. Like, have you ever seen a gamer's discord channel? Like, these are, these are fully automatic words in some European countries that these kids use. So as you can see, my reading of Into the Real was not without some quibbles and criticism, but I still liked it plenty. It was, it was a heck of a ride, and I am very excited to use one of my credits next month to grab the next audiobook and see where uh, Scherer and Ringo take it from here. Yesterday, somebody, uh, a guy named Henry Lanewind, hope I'm saying your name right, Henry, uh, got in the comments on my Lit RPG rant and gave me a really detailed breakdown of the subgenres of Lit RPG. And as he was describing one of them called Full Immersion Virtual Reality, I thought, I'm reading a book that's pretty much this right now. Uh, it's, it's one of those. And so it's, it's going to go on the list of books that figures out how to execute the lit RPG concept properly, or at least in a way that makes it more broadly accessible to people who aren't role players, but would still want to read a book that has some of those core elements to it and works on its own as a sci-fi. There's a, there's a bridge zone in between those two that I'm really comfortable with and where I found some really enjoyable books. This is one of them. I would put it up there, not next to Dungeon Crawler Carl in terms of like that exact level of bonkers, comedy, content, all that stuff, but in terms of how much I enjoyed it, it was up there. So if you like lit RPG, you'll probably like this book. If you like great sci-fi and great YA books, you'll probably like this book. I give it a hearty four stars. And for those keeping track at home, that's two for each of Lynn's gigantic 